Hi everyone. Thank you to AVSA for inviting me to give this program success with Gisnerians. I'm honored to speak with you today. These are different views of my basement plant room. It has one north facing window that never gets direct sun. My room has four plant stands. I'll go into more details later but that yellow arrow is pointing to my walk-in closet filled with plant-related items such as soil and pots. I'm a lucky girl to have that. I found a U-shaped desk for $10 at a garage sale. The most important thing has a yellow arrow pointing to it. It's a box of alcohol wipes. I use, I use a wipe on scissors, knives, or whatever after I'm finished with the plant, hopefully to clean any uh, bacteria, anything I don't want on my next plant. The canning pot is also a garage sale item. It contains my soil that is about 60% perlite. I purchase soilless mixes and pasteurize them. Do a Google search for Dr. Optimara. Add the word pasteurize to read the process. Yes, this is a toilet with a plastic grating over it. I leach my pots with room temperature water when they've been in their pots around 8 to 10 weeks. I let the water drain completely. If leaves are a bit yellow, then I'll pour through them from a different watering can, a mixture of one teaspoon of Epsom salts to a half gallon of water. See the photo on the right. I had a young strep in a solo cup and wanted to transplant it into a three inch pot. First, I leached the solo cup, and then I left it to dry for two or three days before putting it into the next size pot. Why leach? I do not want to put fresh soil around the root ball that has fertilizer salt buildup. Why do I let it dry two to three days? Because I think the new soil and the old soil should be the same dryness. Often gisnerid leaves are damaged, or you'd like to get rid of some brownish edges. You may trim the leaves as long as you follow the natural shape of the leaf. In this case, with streptocarpus, see photo number two, where I'm placing a healthy leaf on top of a bad leaf, and I trim with craft scissors the shape of the good leaf. See photo four, and the yellow arrow is pointing to an African violet leaf stem that I crushed so I'd release its juices. Rub those juices on trimmed leaves and this helps prevent those wounded edges from turning brown. If you've got a show, do this the day before or the day of entries. Yes, I can grow African violets like this one, hybridized by my friend Heinz Dornbusch. It's called Heinz's Harbor Lights. Let's talk fertilizer. I only use eighth of a teaspoon per gallon and never any high bloom, high phosphate fertilizer. Those are ones with a much, much higher center number. My theory is if a plant has healthy roots and leaves, then the plant will produce the maximum number of flowers that genetics allows it. I'm not saying fertilizers I use are the only ones you should use. In fact, you should experiment to see what is best with the soil and water available to you. Make sure, as in the upper left photo, that the fertilizer has trace minerals. I've also been known to add mycorrhiza to my mix. I first heard about it from Mel Grice. It's a fungus that helps the plant's root system with the uptake of phosphorus and nitrogen. And you can order that on the internet too. If you use rainwater or reverse osmosis water, then I suggest you try the Michigan State University fertilizer at the rate of an eighth of a teaspoon per gallon, not the quarter to half teaspoon recommended on the package. The upper left photo shows a large white container. That's my reverse osmosis system installed by my husband. The upper right photo shows the tiny faucet that lets me pour the water into a gallon. 
This particular RO system allows me to have one gallon an hour if I wish. This is my streptocarpus stand. At that time this photo was taken, I was using T8 fluorescent lights, two shop lights per shelf on a homemade stand. And notice my pots are not real large. We'll discuss lights and water reservoirs later. My lights are on 12 hours a day and I never change the amount of time for a show. You see some, something shiny around the reservoirs and those are sandwich or gallon hefty brand baggies I use as diapers. Those diapers enable me to dump old water and throw away the diapers, leaving behind a clean reservoir. I only have to wash lids. This began because my house has a septic tank and I'm not allowed to use bleach. Cleaning reservoirs without bleach is a challenge, hence the diapers. See the ruler that shows you how far down my plants are from, in this case, the T8 lights. My Streptocarpus calaria plant stand now has LED shop lights, the cheapest I can find as long as they're anywhere between 3,000 and 5,000 lumens. When you switch from fluorescent lights to LED lights, consider reducing the hours by about two hours as the LED lights are pretty bright. If you've got a cool growing area like a basement, you might count on the fluorescent lights to give your plants heat. LEDs will not give you the heat. Check the internet to see if you can replace T12 tubes with Philips Instant Fit LED tubes. In my case, they fit in the old ballast and you see here one warm and one cool tube. I'm currently experimenting with LED strip lights. The marijuana growers seem to say that blue light promotes growth and red light promotes bloom. I found growing only under red lights produced floppy plants. See the photo on the right where I have a combination of white and blue. So you can experiment with different colors and see what works best for the particular plants you're growing. My glass shelf plant stand is probably about 50 years old and now it has LED strip lights thanks to my husband. He took my metal fixtures and he removed the tubes. He glued the LED strip lights to the metal. The arrow on the left photo shows the power supply and see the close-up of it on the right side. He has these set up so I can dim the lights if I think they're too bright. Look at the photo on the right. Because my husband removed the old fluorescent tubes, there's more room for my taller plants. My old glass shelf stand is mostly used for syringes, as I'm able to crowd several reservoirs of them on the 12 inch depth. All of my plants are wick watered. My soil is 50 to 60% perlite and I put half an inch of perlite on the bottom of the pot. If I happen to overfill the reservoir, then the standing water keeps the perlite wet rather than my soilless mix sitting in that overfill area. I do not complain about algae in my reservoirs. In fact, I count on those older reservoirs to help me root my plants. In late February of 2016, Hortense Pittman's hybrid Jolly Marvel had quite a neck. I chopped off the top of the plant, scraped the crusty neck with my fingernails, and plopped the neck into the hole of a reservoir with algae water. By March 15th, look at the upper right photo and see healthy roots. It was time to remove baby leaves and pot it into a potential 2.5 inch show plant. I removed all the flower stems and buds until May 15th. The first week of July, I received a blue ribbon at the Gisnerid Society convention for a plant that had been a giraffe in February. 
In the Gesneri Society, only one blue ribbon is given per class, so that was quite an honor. Let's do the same for Seninja. These two photos show results of rooting them in the algae water. Be careful. The problem is, if the tuber or the plants grown underneath get too big, then you've got to cut a larger hole in your reservoir to remove them. For me, the key to a rhizomatous gizneri show plant is rooting several in the reservoir and then putting a group of them in a pot about three months before a show. Let's talk about pot size for streps. See the yellow arrow and see that streps prefer being root bound. This means putting the strep or a group of the same hybrid as species into a pot about four months before a show. Yes, this will mean you leach the pot about two months before the show. I rooted a strep side shoot. I always put the plant into a solo cup using a soaking wet wick and then putting soaking wet perlite in the bottom. Look closely at the center photo and see the arrow pointing to a reddish area. Often, but not always, you will find a color change at the base of the strep leaves. Use that as a guide. Do not bury the plant deeper than that color change. In fact, make sure you are about a quarter of an inch below the top of that color change. See the arrow pointing to how deep I planted this young plant. Also see that the mound of soil is slightly higher than the rim of the pot. I'm using a white label to hold it up. The worst thing you can do is to bury a strep too deep in the pot. Here we go. This is my original seedling of Streptocarpus Dales Polar Canary. The upper left shows that I used a solo cup to make the impression in a three inch pot. Because my seedling had been growing in a solo cup for about three months, I leached that pot, then let it dry out for a couple of days. I placed the root ball totally undamaged into that hole after removing the solo cup mold. I removed all buds until about four to five weeks before the show. When you stop disbudding depends on how warm your room is. Plants will bloom faster if the room is warmer. To get best in show for my own hybrid was surreal. Of course, I bawled like a baby. If you have a leggy plant, especially Smithiantha chimneys or Calaria, you can do what I did to this Sininja brasiliensis. It's called rolling. First, leach the pot, then leave it alone until the top begins to wilt and you can feel the main stem will bend without breaking. Photo 3 shows the root ball. See the white part is perlite and the very bottom of the root ball. In this case, I folded the main stem so I could bury the root ball horizontally into the next larger size pot. If it could have really bent, I'd have done it so that that perlite, the bottom of the pot, was facing totally up towards the ceiling. The last photo has a yellow arrow showing that I put an inverted pot under the reservoir to get the newly potted plant closer to the fixture. Yes, there's a big secret to producing Sininja show plants. I never allow the bottom four leaves to have flowers because when a Sininja leaf produces a flower, that leaf's color gets dull. Often the edges become brownish. In fact, I believe this is also true for Epicia. This was my Gesnerid Society convention entry in 2017. This entry is a multiple. There are three plants in this three inch pot and none were allowed to bloom on the bottom four leaves. See that red arrow? That is pointing to a bud. Remove it. Remove all buds on the bottom four leaves of syningas. 
You're seeing a repeat of how I leach, dry, then transplant to a larger pot, only this time with the syningia. Guess what? I do this with Petrocosmia, Primulina, and many other Gisneriids. Again, the upper left shows the young plant, only this time I remove baby leaves and I pot it deeper past where I took the baby leaves into a larger pot without disturbing the root ball. No flowers will ever bloom on the base four leaves. There is no rule for Gisneriids that baby leaves must be removed. If you're judging, do not penalize if you see them and they are healthy. I'm showing you how I successfully enter Syningia show plants. Here they are without their baby leaves and ready for their first buds to be removed. These should be show plants in about two and a half months. All my micro miniature syningias are grown out in the open on wick reservoirs. They're able to constant feed. I think that's why I have success. Don't tell me your humidity is too low for growing out in the open because I did this in Los Angeles where humidity is as low as 15%. Here's how I start out micro miniature syningias in bonsai pots. That's a wet wick and wet perlite. The tops of the tubers are at the soil line. You may have multiple plants of the same species or hybrid in one pot, but look at the photo on the right. That's a mix of Syningia pusilla and its mutation, two different colors. Sorry, this is not allowed. You can break down a rhizome into scales, and each scale will give you a plant. Eucodonia, Smithiantha, Achimenes, Calaria, all scales will make a plant, but that plant won't be as large as when there's at least a one inch rhizome giving it more energy. Smithiantha Ann's gift was started with a single scale in November for a May ABSA convention. Normally rhizomes don't sprout till about February and so they, the plant just can't be in a spring show. So that's a three inch pot so it was about a third the normal size but fully mature with full quantity of bloom at the AVSA convention and it got a best-in-class ribbon. This plastic saucer with about two inch deep on the sides uh, has holes that I drilled and it's a great base for several types of show plants, including my first ever Best in Show in 1988 with Eucadonia Francis. I had it on a two quart sized reservoirs, so two wicks, one in each reservoir. This Apicia suoni began when I planted some rooted stolons in one of those plastic saucers in November. The goal was that they should get larger, so no stolons or flowers were allowed. This is three months later in February. Since there were some gaps, I selectively let a few stolons grow and I pinned them down. Then March 1st, they were allowed to make buds. Here's the final photo on April 16th. I'll let you look at that for a while. You can also grow an apicia as a single. No stolons ever allowed. I removed all buds and stolons for five months. It needed repotting several times. Again, leech and don't harm the root ball. When I finally let it bloom, it bloomed nonstop for three months. You may contact me on Facebook and ask to be my friend, but I kind of have this rule. If your timeline or photos do not have a photo of a Gisneriid, and remember that includes African violets, then I won't accept you. I'm always a little nervous about spam and stuff. 
The Gaznariot Society produces a free newsletter monthly, and Mel Grice, the current president of the Gaznariot Society, has been the editor for 10 years. So go to this website and read all 10 years worth. You'll learn a lot. Go to this AVSA website and order one of these webinars. For the cost of a reference book, you can download, then watch the webinar, and hear the speaker tell you all about the photos on the screen. Sandy and Andrea are award-winning growers. They'll share how they grow, giving you great ideas for your own plants. And with a webinar, you're able to download them into your computer, watch them anytime. You can fast forward, you can rewind to hear specific details. Dr. Jeff Smith is the columnist for the African Violet Magazine, and he shares with you the best tips for growing African Violet species. Mary Schaefer gets all the credit for an idea of producing webinars for the Gisnerid Society. There are now 24 webinars. Two of them are free, these two. Go to this site and see three pages of webinars on various Gisnerid genera such as Syningia, Streptocarpus, Primulina, Petrocosmia, Calaria, I can go on and on. In addition, Mel Grice has a webinar on making flower arrangements, and he shows some from AVSA and Gisnerid's conventions. Jill and Karen have a webinar on planting of growing material to help you design tray landscapes, terrariums, and natural gardens. I have a webinar on Streptocarpus, another on Syningia, and another on Floris glaxinias, which are actually Syningia speciosa. In addition, there's a master class with four webinars showing you how to hybridize. There's one on Streptocarpus, one on Syningias, and Pat Hancock with Mel Grice tell you all about hybridizing African violets. Remember, she's the Buckeye hybridizer. The bonus webinar is Dr. Jeff Smith educating us on genetics. This is me participating in a Zoom gathering with the Houston African Violet and Gisnerian Society. I brought plants up from the basement to discuss them. See the arrow pointing to the brand of baggies I use for reservoir diapers. Thank you so much for participating in this AVSA 2020 virtual convention.